This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Farben Crane. We're here today with Matan Field. He's been on the show before. We were just checking before and it was in January 2016. And he was working on a project called Backfeed back then. So we're going to speak about that a little bit, but mainly we're going to speak today about his new project, which is a project called DAO Stack which is trying to build kind of tools and frameworks for decentralized organizations. So thanks so much for joining us today, Matan. Thanks, Brian. Really a pleasure to be here again. So maybe we can start there. I mean, so you tell us a little bit about how did you first become involved in the blockchain space and how did that lead to initially starting uh, Backfeed? Sure. So, yeah, I've... I've been working uh, as a theoretical physicist, uh, as a, as my you know as my profession. Done my uh, bachelor's in physics and mathematics, and then PhD in uh, string theory. Uh, so that was like one, kind of like one one side of my uh, of my career. And then in parallel to that, I was very interested in social uh, entrepreneurship and mostly around uh, alternative organizations and cooperatives. So I founded a food cooperative, organic food cooperative, and, and a community garden, and such stuff. And when I was doing my postdoctoral research at the Technion, uh, that was kind of like, I guess, the end of 2013. And during that, I had an idea um, about social ride sharing. And I started to work on that idea with some friends uh, to build a social ride sharing app. And via that project, we quickly discovered the blockchain. We, we had a need for uh, generating cooperation uh, at scale. And, and, and we, I kind of like knew that we need to kind of like somehow track values or value of people uh, and to have some sort of token. I, I didn't know about blockchain back then. And then someone told me, look at, look at Bitcoin, look at this thing, Bitcoin, uh, and even look at this thing, Ethereum. That was the same month when Vitalik published his, his white paper um, no, I think it was November 2013, and when when we looked at that, it was kind of like instantly clicked as a technology that we, we were looking for, and quickly the the project become uh, became a decentralized ride sharing application on the blockchain. Back then, it was on the Bitcoin blockchain. I think it was one of the first applications on the Bitcoin blockchain, um, and and that that kind of like accelerated very fast. I quickly uh, quit the academy and focused full time on that. Uh, but as time went by, I was more and more interested in the core problem of our, how coordinating a large number of people. Uh, and on January 2015, I quit the project. I've quit Lazuz, the ride-sharing project, and founded my own company, Backfeed, to solve that problem. So to build protocols and platforms for coordination of a large number of people or for DAOs. So that was the goal for, uh, uh, of Backfit, founded around January uh, 2015. Um, it was early days. Uh, we still thought that ICO is you know, too, far, you know, too far and risky and, and all that. Uh, we raised the regular legacy capital from angels uh, and have been working for 18 months. Basically just ended our, our, uh, our last uh, work around the explosion of doubt that we'll probably speak about later. And at that, at that point, we kind of like, we felt that we need to stop to hold, hold the moment for a moment and reassess where we are at, uh, uh, reiterate on the, on, on the focus of the product. I, I, one of the most like the urgent burning thing was that I didn't have a technological partner and I didn't want to continue further without finding that partner. And then I took uh, the time to uh, do some research, both finding that technological partner and uh, focusing the product that we wanted to build after like 18 months of building several iterations, se several uh, products. Um, yeah, it took, it took six months to, to make this focus and mostly to join forces with my uh, main partner, Adam Levy, 
who was also a, a, a PhD in physics that I knew from the academy, but he's also a high, very highly talented uh, technologist. And around January 2017, we founded DAOSTAC. We, we thought in the, in the beginning, we thought a lot whether to continue it as Backfit or found a new company. But after some iterations and checking ups with, um, you know, with external players, we realized that it would not be feasible to continue under the same, uh, it was too kind of like too long has been passed and it would not be feasible, uh, for example, to raise money to the old company. So we started as, as, a, as a new entity. Uh, we also started with a, with a new strategy, a new code base and everything, but the idea was similar to build the platform for uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. Cool, fantastic. Now, so you worked on, on Backfeed, right, which is a similar problem, and then you switched or you started DAOSTAC. Are there some kind of big insights or learnings that you took away from Backfeed? So you said like, okay, these things I'm going to have to pay special attention to, or these things I'm going to have to do differently this time? Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, when I started Backfeed, I was kind of like more thinking along the interface, like how the interface to, for DAOs looks like. Um, only after a few months, I realized that the big, big problem is not even the interface. I mean, the interface is a problem, but there is a, like there is a lower problem of the protocol, like how DAOs are operating, game theoretically. And already within Backfeed, I, I kind of like shifted from focus on the interface to focus on the protocol. One of the lessons from Backfeed was that this, this protocol space is enormous and, and, there's, and, and it contains a lot of uh, big challenges and more so that uh, different use cases and different elements in the DAO landscape, if you wish, will require different protocols. So one of the main understanding from Backfit was that it's not maybe right to focus and build, build a protocol, but rather it's build a, better build a framework from which you can build any DAO protocol and let those protocol evolve under economic evolution. So if you want to uh, get ready for building a, an infrastructure for an, ec for an ecosystem and then let the, that, that infrastructure evolve over time, so that, that was the, one of the biggest uh, shifts made from Backfit to DAOSTAC. In DAOSTAC, we, we, instead of tr tackling a protocol or a use case, we firstly tackle, we firstly build a whole framework for governance, with which kind of like, we, we'll probably get back to that later, but we call that WordPress for DAOs. So a framework with which you can build any uh, governance protocol. That was one big lesson for Backfit. Maybe another big lesson was that in Backfit, we kind of like started very theoretical and you know we firstly wanted to solve everything theoretically and then and then to start building things physically um, and even if we said we firstly built off chain because the, the technology was not mature and we said yeah we'll get to the to, to, to be on chain only when the technology is maturing up further and in back in in DAOSTAC, I realized that we have to develop with the technology we have to mature up with the technology so we started code our code base on the blockchain from day one it was really important uh, with, a, with an aim, with a very specific aim to produce a, a very specific product um, and get it to, you know, to market adoption. And later, we also built on top of that infrastructure, we also built uh, applications, or right now one application for, for now. Um, so it was kind of like, in a way, I would say the different, the order of things was kind of like upside down. So I'm interested in, in this approach that you've described to building this product. So you mentioned that when you were building Backfeed, that uh, you, you were building specific use cases and that you um, sort of shifted uh, in, in DAO stack to building a, a more generic platform. Is, is that correct? Correct. That's exactly correct. I mean, eventually we go back to use cases, but we had to take one step backwards to build a more robust framework, uh, both in order to, you know, to be able to produce a, a vast number um, of products and also to enable others to build product, but also from the understanding that those products will have to evolve rapidly and you need to be ready with an infrastructure that can allow you to evolve them rapidly. So how much uh, of, your, of the work that you had done on Backfeed sort of has now been ported over into DAOStack? Um, in terms of Products, and not necessarily. I mean, applications like any product, the code base, uh, you know, protocols or anything you, you can name as products, uh, almost zero. 
we completely kind of like started from scratch, code base, protocol, everything we started from scratch. But of course, I would say that we started from scratch in the right place because of the lessons learned uh, before. So how you measure that in, in, in percentage, that's for you to decide. So let's speak a little bit about DAOs in general. Can you, first of all, define what is a DAO? Sure. I mean, sure is, is an overstatement. That's, that's a quite, quite hard thing. Um, so firstly, firstly, the centralized organization is something that, I mean, an organization, generally, an organization is something that gets input from agents, right, members of the organization, and then spells out output, products, decisions, um, transactions, and so on and so forth. Now, the, dis the one first difference of DAO from regular organization is that the rules of processing inputs into outputs, those rules are coded on the blockchain. They are coded on a trustless decentralized technology. That's the first uh, difference. A second difference is that those rules allow for a organizations to grow and scale wide while become decentralized, which means that this decision-making process is not held by a small number of people, or agent members in the organizations. Uh, that's another way to, or another criteria, if you want, so this, of decentralization. Now, you can also ask, like, what is the, how they look like? Not like the definition, but rather, like, what is the flavor of DAOs? So I would say that the characteristic of flavor of DAOs is that since, since decision-making is pretty distributed, um, one outcome is that these organizations are much, much more scalable. Much more scalable and still much more, and at the same time remain, remaining much more agile. Um, so if you, there is, there is like actually a very, very well-defined way to, to characterize that. So every organization on the planet has, has a common factor which is that they become less effective per person as they grow up, as they scale up. So I imagine that DAOs is something, on the contrary, more similar to the way that network effects and free markets and internet works, is that these are structures that make decisions and make products and coordinate, but at the same time become more effective when they scale up. So it's kind of like the opposite of the way that regular organization uh, behaves when you, when you grow them up. Um, and with that, it's also the prediction that once you created that um, creature, it will basically grow up exponentially, explode in that domain, in its domain. So can, can you perhaps give some examples of um, what are some decentralized organizations that exist today or that have existed in the past that, uh, you know, don't, not necessarily in the blockchain space or, or that use blockchain technology, but just generally speaking, what are some good examples of decentralized uh, autonomous organizations that don't function with a central governing structure? So firstly, there is no, um, you know, full-blown DAO does not exist. I mean, I'm, I'm claiming that there is, you know, there is a need for that. I think it will explode once it exists, but it doesn't exist yet. However, we have many examples of things that are almost DAOs or you know, seem to be close to or reminding us or giving or hinting us how DAOs will look like. So, for example, in the blockchain space, so blockchain itself, right? Blockchain itself is in a way an organization, it's a coordination of a large number of people uh, producing something. The difference though is that it's producing very, very specific thing. Um, it cannot do anything else. Um, the Ethereum project, not the blockchain itself, but actually the network around the project, the, you know, including the com developer community and all that, is you know, getting closer to something that looks like DAO, but not yet. Um, and you can also look at examples which are st decentralized structures, but they don't get, again, they don't have a decision-making capacity, such as the internet itself, or BitTorrent, or you know, open source organizations, Etc. But they don't have a decision-making capacity that we are speaking about. Um, maybe the closest thing that I'm aware of right now is something like uh, actually I've met the CEO of Rloop. So I think it's one of the most exciting projects that I've I've met. Uh, it's the it's the team that was winning the the Elon Musk competition about generating Hyperloop technology, and while they 
you know, other competing team that did not win the contest uh, raised 200 and 300 million dollars. The winning team was building a, a working technology with, uh, you know, a half, a half the speed and fifth the scale with a budget of 200,000 dollars and 1,300 distributed engineers over 60 countries, all of, all of which hold day jobs. So that's like this, the closest thing that I've heard of uh, to decentralized organizations. Um, and, and the, but the, the decision making capacity is still in there uh, in terms of budgeting and all that was still fairly centralized, I, I guess, um, and also was very much based on good faith, like on volunteering. Um, but if you would like to reproduce this kind of behavior uh, on you know different causes, not based on volunteering, and on a, on a, you know, on a more general uh, domains and at a larger scale, you definitely need to have a systematic decision making. Uh, engine that can scale up indefinitely. When we think about DAOs, or, or when you think about DAOs, is this something that you see as just the next form of organization? You know, maybe had like different forms of organizations in the past, and now there's going to be DAOs, which is basically, you know, structured organizations where you have like, explicit processes for making this uh, decisions, you know, that kind of scale, you have these network effects. So do you think that down the line, you know, most companies will be sort of DAOs, maybe countries or like large social organizations or local organizations and maybe nonprofit communities. Will they all start to resemble DAOs or is DAOs more uh, a solution to a specific problem which applies to, you know, maybe a small number of, of use cases? That's, that's a really good question. So I think the answer is yes. Oh, or let me let me make it more specific. I th the advantage of a DAO is at large scale. You know, if you if you operate an organization of thirty, not necessarily the centralized organization is superior to a centralized organization. But if you're operating an organization of one hundred thousand people, then yes, I think that the centralized organization is vastly more effective than centralized organizations. And thus, just like the the way that internet, so internet replaced you know kind of like global wide distribution networks completely. But then you still have distribution networks and, you know, uh, locally and inside the internet. So in the same way, I think that large organization will be completely decentralized in the future, but you'll still have companies operating in that you know, global decentralized network. Um, but, 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 but still, at scale, I think that DAOs will be orders of magnitude more effective than regular organization, and thus just evolutionarily, I think every organization will either need to decentralize itself or basically be outcompeted vastly. So does that mean, I guess the implications of this would also be you see in the future kind of the demise of, you know, the organizations that we know today, whether that will be something like, you know, the US government or Apple or or maybe even United Nations, like all of those very large, complex, centralized organizations, you think those will essentially be outcompeted and, and just not be able to ad adapt and respond as fast as, as DAO-run organizations? I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a process, and it's going to be a long process. Um, and th there are domains where DAOs are kind of like, it's harder to, to decentralize them. So, for example, anything that, the, that its core activity is essentially physical and geographically local is a bit less fit to the model that I'm describing. So, just because of that, naturally, I think states will much, be much harder to decentralize. Um, uh, also, you know, anything that, that, that the main assets that the, that the organization is managing are physical assets. For example, and, and not only, I mean, also the ownership structure is kind of like, so for example, factories. Factories are maybe last to be decentralized. Um, you need to decentralize the, te the technology of manufacturing in order to decentralize them. I mean, you can decentralize the ownership of the factories already today, but decentralize the actual production will require you to, you know, to, for example, to, go, to be based on 3D printing, and, 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 and etc. So, or mi micro factories. So, yeah, I think it's not like black and white, uh, and it's not that Google will disappear tomorrow, but definitely what will happen is that 
those organizations will, gr will also um, gradually move towards greater degree of decentralizations. So what, what do you think is the positive outcome if this really happens like that and we're going to have these super well-working large number of decentralized organizations at scale? Like what, what will the world look like? That's a really good question because also it, it communicates with the question of good and bad, right? So, you know, one way to look at things is, is simply about efficiency. I mean, things, a lot of things will become much more efficient. The market will become more efficient, opportunities, etc. But that's, that's just one aspect and I think not the most interesting one. The more interesting aspect, you know, I think and I think so every, more and more, more so every day, I mean, if you look almost every place that you look at the world, the, you know, the systems, when you look at the system, how things work, you know, what motivates agents in the system and how they behave, you feel that everything is broken. Like, literally everything is broken. And when you look inside, you, you understand why it's broken. It's broken for a reason. It is broken for the good reason, or not good reason, but for the real reason that the, there is no good alignment of incentives. Like, you know, I just spoke about it uh, today with a friend. Just take, just take it, any topic of your in, on your mind. Like take the topic of a garage. Like my, my garage owner doesn't have the incentive to actually repair my car. He actually has the incentive for my car to be as broken as it can. Or the health system doesn't have an incentive for us to be healthy. It actually has incentive to keep us sick. And that's built in in the economy, economics. And, and, and then it derives the rest. And, and, and part of that problem of incentives is, is, the, is the ability to capture the power. So the power is, is constantly uh, concentrates in, you know, in, in the hands of few, and then, and then the interests are aligned around the interests of those, of those individuals, so, or, or centers, not necessarily individuals. So one, I think, big, big shift would be that power will be much more distributed on one hand. Uh, number two is that uh, crypto economics models will design a much much greater alignment of interests, and on general, I think the, the global uh, you know network economy will be much more not not only much more efficient but also um, much more you know I'm, I'm I'm trying to be careful here not to say fair because I, I I have in my mind the word fair but I think it's not just about fairness it's about more resiliency and sustainability and and you know harvesting more of the power of more people because they are more involved in greater alignment. And eventually, I, I should also, what, I don't want to advocate for that, but I, I, I also think that's the only way that to actually resolve the, you know, the weak, 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 weak problem, wicked problem uh, such as climate and, 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 and other problems that we're facing. That's actually the only way to resolve that. I think without that, trying to resolve climate while there are major gigantic corporations that have the incentive to actually make our situation worse is just like fighting, you know, Don Quixote in in a, in, a, in the windmills. So in the white paper, uh, it says that uh, the DAO stack is sort of WordPress for DAOs, and that one would be able to create a DAO just as easily as one can create a blog uh, on WordPress. Can you explain what this means and what this will look like for um, the end users? So whether these are you know, developers or entrepreneurs or actual users of the DAOs that will be built on this platform. Absolutely. So, so when you say a DAO, uh, you can look at it from several different levels. So let's see at like the first level. The, the first level is the level of the game, right? When you say a DAO, you say there is a game. There are certain rules. People can play. People can input whatever they want into those rules, and things happen, right? That's that's the game. Now, of course, the rules is that is one layer. Uh, by the way, there is a layer be below the rules, which is the blockchain, of course. This is the, the layer that facilitates those rules. So there is the blockchain, and then there is the layer of rules. And then you also have higher layers, such as interfaces, right? The way that people actually interact. So if you, if you zoom in for a moment at the layer of rules, when I say that you can um, you know, establish a DAO and, and, you know, and, and, and operate a DAO, um, easily, like yeah, like you would build a blog from a WordPress in WordPress. The meaning is that you 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 have you already have we already have that you have a framework of rules. It's a framework of rules for coordination of people. 
that you don't need, if, if now I want to establish a new DAO with its own rules, with its own governance protocol, I don't, need to, I don't need to code that from scratch. And rather, I have many modular, many modules of rules for coding people, and I can build you know, a few modules one into the other, like plug and play, combine them, and you know, boom, I have a decentralized organization. And I want to have slightly different rules, great. I can pick up a different module, plug it in, maybe configure some parameters, and I have another organization, and so on and so forth. So I don't need to code the rules each time in the beginning, but that's also why it's very easy to upgrade the rules um, you know, and evolve them over time. So that's, that's at, the, at the rules level. Now, at the same thing you can imagine at the interface level, but I mean, our focus right now is on that level to enable others, and also ourselves, but mostly to enable others build their own interfaces, but then you can think about the same ideology at the interface level. You have certain you know, components that you can put inside and build an interface uh, for a DAO. So as a user, if I'm building a DAO on DAO stack, uh, I would have access to interfaces through which I could very easily, as you mentioned, sort of pl plug and play, you know, build this... Uh, uh, this DAO uh, sort of like with Lego blocks, right? And like bringing all the different rules and components and government stru governance structures and, uh, and schemas that I need for my organization. I think may maybe where the challenge is and where I'd like you to uh, address how um, DAO stack would address this is uh, as, as a user building a DAO, uh, perhaps uh, I need some guidance as to what types um, of blocks like what which plugins do i need basically to that to that, that are better suited or better adapted to the type of organization that i'm building let me maybe give you an analogy uh if uh if i'm building a company that's meant to scale to many employees you know hundreds of employees sort of spread out across the world um you know with some venture capital from different places around the world and certain types of uh corporate structures like you know there are um Sort of established uh, ways that you can start a company for that, or if I'm starting a small a small business that's only going to operate in one country, well, you know, perhaps there's a certain type of legal structure that I need. Or if I'm building uh, a DAO, well, maybe I want to have a Swiss foundation and a you know a, a company in Delaware. Similarly, for any type of decentralized organization, you know, one can presume that uh, there will be certain structures that will be adapted to certain organizations. How will uh, DAO stack or how would a user be sort of educated and gain the knowledge necessary to, to, to build the right type of DAO for his organization? Yeah, great question. I mean, totally. So the whole idea of the stack is to provide different solutions at different levels to different, you know, level of users. So for example, if you start from top, top down, if you start, you know, with the average user, then instead of working with modules and plugging them in, you have completed templates. So you have one, two, three, four templates, you know, with names for different use cases in different, under different conditions, and then you can just click a button and that's it. You, you have a template, you just need to feed in the parameters, for example, the founders of the DAO, you know, the voting power that each of them hold, or something like that, or the token distribution, etc. So you'll have um, kind of like completed templates. Then for slightly more advanced users that want to kind of like play, play themselves and, you know, and kind of like experiment with different governance protocol, you'd have modules, completed modules that you can combine and get it out. For slightly more advanced users and so developers, you have the library of modules, but then it's an open source library and then any developer can come up and add yet another uh, module, a new rule that you can play with and so on and so forth. So, so yeah, so you have, you, we, we, we have a solutions at different levels uh, for different audiences, for an advanced user or for the earliest users. This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of leading cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Gnosis, Monero, Golem, Augur, and so many more. When you go to shapeshift.io, you simply select your currency pair, give them your receiving address, send the coins, and boom. Shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange. You don't need to create an account. You don't need to give them your personal information and they don't hold your coins. So you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor.
Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is. So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. Can you walk us through the different layers of the platform, uh, the different sort of layers of the stack and the role of each layer? Um, as I mentioned, there is, the, of course, the blockchain. And then above the blockchain, there is the rules for governance of organization. Maybe just a question on that. So block, blockchain, does this mean like Ethereum or like a new blockchain? Or will DAO stack kind of be able to operate on many different blockchains? Or how is that going to work? Yeah, good point. So right, right now, we are all coded on the Ethereum blockchain. Thank you for that. Uh, over Solidity. Um, in the future, there is no reason why not to be interoperable over uh, several blockchains. But right now, the only blockchain that makes sense for that is Ethereum. Uh, so yeah, that's the, that's that's the current situation. Probably for you know for seeing future. So you have the blockchain there. You can also have a, you know the central database layer such as IPFS. We actually our earliest version was coded on IPFS as well, but. But right now we are we are still database wise we're using centralized servers, um, and then you have the, the rules layer. So we call it Arc. Uh, Arc is a framework for governance, which which you could basically architect different governance protocol, basically any governance protocol. So kind of like like somewhat analogous the way you'd say, okay, with Ethereum I can I can I can program any any a, a smart contract. Then with is with, with ARC, it's a higher level framework of solidity with which you can program any governance protocol. Um, so this is the next layer. Um, basically, yeah. And, and so question on that. So if you say any governance protocol, do you mean like, let's say, different types of voting systems or, or maybe something else where you have some kind of... Right, right, right. So, so what, what do we mean by any governance protocol? So I would say that any governance protocol, as I mentioned, governance protocol is simply that logic that collects input of agents and translate that into decisions, outputs. Whether the decisions are transaction of funds, budget, or um, whether decisions are registering results on a databases, or maybe operating yet another function. So generally, this engine of make, collecting inputs and making decisions, you can, and that's what we call governance, you can break it into two categories of rules, two kind of rules, the do's and the don'ts. So do's means that you know, if, if certain things happen, then we do such and such. For example, one, one example for that is voting systems. You know, if someone makes proposals and then certain number of people say yes, then under some condition, let's execute that proposal. So this is a voting system, a voting logic, and that's a yes, that's a do's kind of rules. Another, another kind of do's can be a token sale. You know, if someone is, is sending such and such ether to that contract, under some conditions, the contract will automatically print new tokens and send it back. That's, a, that's also a kind of do's. Then the other family is the don'ts, which means that let's, for example, crystallize the organization with the statement, no matter what will ever happen, the organization will not print more than one million tokens. So that's a don't. Um, no matter what, this organization that managed one million dollars will not spend more than, more than $50,000 a month. That's a burn, a burn rate. That's another don't. And you can... The, the architecture is, is as flexible as it can get, so you can actually combine the dos and the dos. For example, no matter what, you will not burn out, burn more than $50,000 a month, but scheme number six that can, can approve in the voting with majority of 70% of reputation can change myself, can change the don't. So you can combine those things and basically create uh, any sort of logic for those rules, or if you wish, any governance uh, system. So that's the layer. That's the layers of rules. It's called Arc. Uh, then we realize that if we want to build an ecosystem, if you want, we want now to allow for you know thousands of front front, front end developers uh, to work with this engine and to build collaborative decentralized applications, we need to make it much more accessible. So then we've built a ArcJS, which is a JavaScript library over Web3 that allows you to basically operate Arc, build, build organizations, configure them, operate them, vote, anything directly with, with commands 
uh, over JavaScript. Uh, there is some other layers that maybe are secondary uh, in importance, and then of course at the end you have the layer um, of the applications. So many different applications that's due to the fact that they're all writing on, over the same open protocol, they're all interoperable. So different DAOs can use different interfaces implementing them. Do you mind speaking a little bit about the Genesis DAO and what, what is the role of the Genesis DAO in, in this ecosystem of different tools? The idea was that we have to, we will have to experiment. I mean, we have to do some dog fooding. We have, we have to eat our own dog food. So while we have a company that works on, you know, further building uh, eff effectively right now uh, the DAO stack platform, uh, we want to have also a parallel experiment, a parallel decentralized experiment that kind of like aims at the same goal, same mission. So the Genesis DAO will actually, uh, so maybe, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it's here a moment to me mention we've done like a, a token sale initially privately and eventually some, 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 some of it was publicly um, and we've raised a, back then at the date was $30 million dollars. And, and the idea is that majority of that fund, uh, in, in addition to majority of token distribution, will be managed uh, by that decentralized fund. So Genesis is that decentralized fund that operates on top of DAO stack with majority of that capital in, in, and in that uh, uh, empowers and, 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 and uh, uh, engines, if you want, the growth, establishment of the growth of the DAO stack ecosystem. So, you know, rewarding and investing and supporting projects that support the DAO stack ecosystem in one of three ways, either projects the, that um, build uh, infrastructure components of the, of the stack, uh, more tools, more, more plugins, more modules, more governance modules, um, or projects that are building more interfaces to the stack, more applications. So we've built the first application, the native application Alchemy, and now there's a bunch of other applications integrated with the stack. So companies that are building interfaces and applications uh, integrated with the stack. And finally, projects that are themselves DAOs that are using the stack in order to you know, yet do something else. Maybe build something else or organize or manage collective, collectively manage assets or collectively curate uh, databases or whatever. So that, that's the idea of the Genesis DAO. So this first application that you've built, this, uh, this Alchemy application, uh, what does it do precisely? Right, so Alchem Alchemy was, I mean, initially we wanted to build the first interfaces for, DA for DAOs. So how, how do you make a, a, a large number of people organize and build something together? But then we decided to focus, to make it slightly more focused and answer a real need that people have right now. And so it's a decentralized budgeting and rewarding system, so which answers the, the, the following pain. So today you have in the blockchain space, you have a lot many examples of projects that have very large capital. So for example, the, you know, the, the flagship example would be uh, the Ethereum Foundation, the, the Ethereum project itself. So the Ethereum project, let's say managed, you know, just throwing a number, managed a $1 billion in capital. So, one billion dollars is, is roughly infinity, right? It's much more than you can spend uh, in a short time frame. So it, it has infinite capital. Uh, so okay, so there is no there is no uh, limiting factor in terms of capital. Now it also have thousands of developers, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of de developers that could work on the Ethereum ecosystem. So there is also no shortage of human capital. So what is the limiting factor? What is the actual limiting factor right now? for solutions, for producing solutions. Like why haven't we solved yet the scalability problem? Is it, do we lack, do the Ethereum Foundation lack capital? The answer is no. Do the Ethereum Foundation lacks developers? I mean, in, in, you know, in the broader ecosystem, the answer is no. The actual answer is the decision-making capacity to wisely deploy capital into human capital and produce solutions. And that's exactly the role for Alchemy. So decentralizing that function, the decision-making function. So it's a, it's a, you know, people can get into the system, they can make any proposal to use of that fund, and then people can vote on that proposal and produce decisions in large numbers and effective, in capacity and effectivity. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about that because this is one of the things that, you know, concerns me a little bit is that all of these projects have started, right? And, and they raised money and maybe into foundations. And now they meant to launch these decentralized networks, but they're actually operated or controlled in, in a fairly centralized way. And, and now I think that's it's not the fault of these people or, or, you know, it's not the fault of these projects. It's just that the tools aren't there yet to, to kind of build in a decentralized way from the ground up. But, I'm you know, I'm unsure how well it will actually work to over time transition to a more decentralized organization or whether this will not be sort of uh, fatal for many projects that they will never be able to decentralize anymore. So I think when people, when projects can from the very start, like, you know, deploy funds and manage and grow in this collaborative decentralized way, I think that would be extremely powerful. Yeah, I agree with you, but I, I, I have to admit that I'm quite surprising also by the big projects how seriously they're, they're, they're desiring to decentralize themselves uh, and, and more so willing to do real live experiments with real funds uh, to check that out. Um, like, I think a lot of the big, biggest projects in the space right now sincerely look for DAO solutions to manage their hundreds of millions of dollars. They just are waiting to see that technology comes up. And once the technology is ready, and it's almost ready, we are launching the pilot these days, and, and then actually experiment with real projects, like such as Gnosis, for example. Um, and I think then we can explore, you know, maybe not with $100 million, but maybe with, you know, $100,000 first, and, and a million dollars then. Uh, but once we can show, we can show that we have a technology for, for producing large number of decisions effectively by the professional crowd, and then we produce much, much faster growth and innovation. And I think... Once once project would see that, you will see massive adoption. So let's talk about consensus. The uh, white paper states that uh, that DAO stack uses uh, a consensus model called holographic consensus. Can you describe uh, this consensus model and how it's different from uh, the ones that we know, uh, like proof of stake, and proof of work? Right. So firstly, just to, just a word on proof of stake for it's a different kind of consensus. So, so there are basically there are two kind two families of consensus. Um, actually, we can discuss more than two, but let's let's focus on two. Um, you have you have consensus about I call them objective realities. So blockchain is a consensus engine for about objective reality. So uh, objective realities are realities that the computer can decide if it's a, if it's a yes or a no. Um, so so for example, they whether to add a block, whether the block is legitimate is an objective reality, right? The program can read that and say yes or no. So objective consensus are falling under the title blockchain. That's what a blockchain is. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a decentralized consensus engine for objective realities. Uh, and then you have proof, there you have proof of work, proof of stake, and so on and so forth. Now the interesting stuff, or the next interesting stuff, is about reaching consensus about subjective realities. So, for example, whether this claim insurance should be, you know, handled or not, um, whether you know that that article is good or bad, whether we want to approve budgeting with ten thousand dollars this or that task. So this is subjective because a program cannot read that and say yes or no, because by definition the decision is subjective; it's not objective. The first step was to build consensus engines uh, for subjective realities, and that's what falls under the title decentralized governance. Now, what is the problem of decentralized governance? And it's actually the exact analogy, analogic problem to decentralized, uh, I mean, the consensus of objective reality. It's the same problem, which is the scalability problem. So just as we have scalability problem of blockchains, you have scalability problem of decentralized governance systems. Now, what is the scalability problem? It's very easy to understand. You have 1,000, let's say, let's make it easy. You have 1 million uh, uh, voters, 1 million agents in an organization, and let's say that they are equal voters. So each of them has equal weight, you know, voting one. Now, naively, if you want, if you want to be resilient, like if you, if you want to um, make sure that the system is not manipulated by a small group of people, that the system is well represented by the majority, you know, the decisions that are made are in line with majority, you, you would need to require that each and every decision is looked by you know, the entire, by, by a majority, by, approved by a majority of the organization. 
But then of course, that completely doesn't make sense. I mean, you, you, would, you wouldn't be able to produce a single decision and, and definitely not a million decisions a day or a million decisions a month. So you see, there is a strong tension between scalability, the ability to produce more and more decisions effectively, and resilience, the incorruptibility uh, or non-manipulability of those decisions by small minorities, and even more so, having those decisions be representing really the, you know, the, the, the mind of that, the high, this hive mind of the DAO. So to solve that problem, and that, I think that was the biggest actual problem of, of DAOs uh, up until today. So to solve that problem, we've designed a uh, holographic consensus. Now, there are some alternative solutions. One of the hottest, I think, of them is, for example, uh, TCRs, uh, token curated registries. But then I can also, we can also dig into why I think those pure economic governance models do, do not, will not work well. And the, the root of holographic consensus is basically combining two different systems inside the governance system. One system is the reputation system. Uh, votes are weighted, uh, votes of, are weighted, uh, agents' votes are weighted by the reputation. These systems are highly resilient, are not very well manipulated, um, but they have problem of scalability. And on the, other hand, on the other hand, markets, like prediction markets, for example, they are highly scalable. Uh, but their problem is they are highly manipulable. So we combine those two systems together. You have both a prediction uh, engine and prediction market and a reputation system, and together you can show that you can generate both scalable and resilient interaction at the same time. You're basically translating the tension between scalability and resilience into an economic problem that you can always grow if you are willing to uh, pay more costs. Um, and basically the prediction engines, so the people who are placing the prediction, they are not answering like a future key, for example, they are not answering what is the right answer, like what they want to be uh, the result, but they are, they are actually placing predictions about, about what they think that the reputation system will decide. So that's, that's, that's the core essence of programming consensus. And, and, and in, in essence, maybe just to say what it allows you, it allows you to make decisions, fast decisions, by small minorities, but at the same time, ensure that those decisions will be in line with the greater majority, with the down majority. And the way that it, it ensures that is that you're basically creating an, a crypto economic incentive to identify possible mismatches. So anyone that can identify a mismatch between a process that seems to go to that way and what people think that the DAO would vote would be that way, anyone that can identify that mismatch can make profits by predicting that mismatch. This is actually quite interesting. Could, could you elaborate a bit more, maybe walk us through um, how decisions are made with holographic consensus? Like if it's a concrete example uh, of how, so if you marry this reputation system and this prediction market, and who are the actors basically taking part in this consensus? Right, yeah, let, let me give you a concrete example. By the way, I also need to kind of say that this holographic consensus is really a concept, just as much as blockchain is a concept and off-chain off computation is a concept. Actually, there is, there is a close analogy between off-chain computation and holographic consensus. Um, and I'm saying that to kind of like um, explain that once you understand the concept, you can have diff many different protocols that falls under that title. So it's not a, it's not a protocol, it's a concept. Now, but, but, but nevertheless, let's go through a concrete example. So um, let's say that uh, let, let's focus on the simplistic version, which you, you have a, a DAO that makes a yes-no decision. So anyone can throw on this DAO uh, proposals. I propose to do such and such, you propose to do such and such, and the DAO, the collective mind, just saying yes, yes, no, no, yes, no, yes. Um, now, so anyone can open a proposal. Now, then there is a reputation system that uh, weigh the voting power of agents. Now. When, when a proposal is being opened, is it open into a queue? So just a list of proposals. Now, by default, if a proposal on the list, on the queue, uh, needs, if you want to execute that proposal, you need to kind of have um, absolute majority of reputation holders uh, uh, supporting it. So actually 50% of the entire reputation of the DAO need to, needs to say yes in order to execute the proposal. This is completely resilient, very coherent, and unmanipulable. The problem, of course, is that it's not scalable. So now, the next step is that you would like to allow, 
you would like to allow uh, to boost, to accelerate the process of decision making at some, under some conditions. So what, what, I'm, what I mean by that is that you, you would, allow, you would al like to allow decisions to be open for finite time voting. So let's say that I, take, I, wanna, I wanna boost the decision, which means that I open that decision for one week, and then whoever vote on that decision in that one, within that one week, makes a decision. So if the majority of those voters says yes, it's being executed, majority says no, it's not, it's rejected. Now that's of course very scalable, you can, you can process any number of decisions you want, but of course then again it's not resilient, because now I can, I can attack the system by opening millions of, 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 of boosted proposals, and, and then most of them will be remain unnoticed because the collective attention will be completely diluted. Um, so how do, you, how do you fix that? So now there is this second system comes in play. Uh, while those decisions are in queue, there is a second thing that you can do with that and is to make predictions about the, about the, the fate of those decisions. So you can come and you can use, I'm proposing a decision to uh, budget uh, my task of producing the next feature. I need $20,000 and I'm proposing to allocate to me $20,000. Now you're coming and you're looking at that decision and you, you have familiarity with that DAO and you're basically making the prediction. You're saying, okay, I know that uh, this guy has a reputation. I know that this, this proposal makes sense. So I know, you know, I know the, the way that the people here think. I know some of the reputation holders. I predict that this decision is going to pass. And I'm also willing to stake some tokens over that attestation. So I'm willing to stake you know, $1,000 that this decision will pass in the DAO if enough people look at it. Okay? So now, um, basically, when you do that, you are putting your, uh, your capital at stake. So if, you, if eventually you'll be right, you will gain more capital, more tokens, and then if, if you uh, will be uh, wrong, you will lose your stake. Now, the way that this prediction engine connects with the voting system is that the only uh, the only uh, uh, condition, the only way that a proposal can be boosted is if enough predictors are predicting um, that it's going to pass. So that's, that's the first uh, instance. And then once, and, and for, for without, without too much challenge, so without too much of others predicting that it's not going to pass. So the, the relative people that think that it's going to pass with respect to those who think it's not going to pass is crossing some threshold. And then once it, it did cross some threshold, then the proposal is being boosted, and then people uh, are voting on it, and still people always can, can always predict against the, consent, against the status. So if the status of the decision is that it's got, it seems to be passing, you can bet against it by predicting it's not going to pass, and if, and if it seems that it's not going to pass, you can bet against it by predicting that it is going to pass. Um, and then also those who predicted, place the prediction, they also have incentives uh, to kind of like hold the process and make sure that those who needs to vote in order to reflect the truth that they think they uh, exist to make sure to call them out and make and, 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 and remind them that they need to vote because it seems that the reality right now is incorrect. Um, and then of course uh, the voters place the vote uh, in the subjective uh, uh, requiring the subjective majority and if it's uh, being approved uh, the, the, the thing is executed and, and, and otherwise. And, and not executed and rejected otherwise. And, and now we can get into details in the game theory and show that actually this system can, and also I, I skipped you know, a few parameters and so, and so on, but you can see that this system is, is fully resilient into manipulation and you can also see that it can process more and more decision, in fact indefinitely providing uh, uh, some cost and the cost comes in in the fact that the DAO itself needs to be put a bounty that is basically distributed to successful predictors for successful uh, proposals. So you're basically essentially you're translating the tension between scalability and resistance into a cost of the DAO management cost, if you would, if you wish. Yeah, this is great. I, you know, we, we did podcasts before on Future Key. I think we, we did we, multiple before with Ralph Merkel and, and and Robin Hansen as well. And and it's it's a it's a really cool concept, but it seems sort of you know hard to make work and maybe not so realistic in the short to medium term, but this to use prediction markets to kind of manage the, you know, priorities and, you know, manage the, the scale at which uh, a DAO can process 
proposals and decisions, I think is, is really great and very elegant and seems quite, quite simple. And, and so, yeah, so that's, that's great. It will be very interesting to see this in life with, with an actual DAO. Cool. So uh, uh, let's let's move to to another topic, which is a little bit about the sort of economies and economics of this. One thing that is written about in the white paper is that the DAO stack is based on this concept of circular token economies. Can you describe what that is? Sure, it's actually not a, a fancy concept. It's it's quite trivial, and and you all know it. And just we just you know added there for readers that are not familiar with the blockchain space very well. But basically, it's just the regular DAP economy, where you you have a token you know a token economy where on one hand you are printing and distributing tokens to contributors of value. For example, in the blockchain, it would be miners, right? But now since you have a general purpose decision making engine, you can you can distribute those tokens to any contributor of value. I mean, someone who write, is writing, so right now in the Bitcoin, or in the, you know, if someone is writing a, 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 a code and, 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 and plays a pull request, successful pull request, he will not be compens you know, compensated by Coinbase Bitcoin, right? Additional Bitcoin. Um, but you can actually make a DAO that print new tokens for any sort of contribution of value. You just need to agree about what is value and what is not. So on one hand, tokens are being produced to contributors of value. And then on the other side of that loop, tokens need to be consumed to consume the value that is being created. So for example, if it's a blockchain and the value is created is the blockchain itself. And then if you want to use the blockchain, you need to spend the same tokens that were you know, distributed to miners, then you need to spend them in order to use the, the network effect that is created by the miners, which is the blockchain. So, uh, and that, and that, that same circular economy I mean, it's critical to have that circular economy is critical in order to build the network effect um, uh, correctly. And I think that every DAP, every DAP economy should have that circular economy in place. And if it doesn't, it has a broken model. So, yeah, now you may ask, what is the circular economy, I guess, of DAO stack? Is it correct? Yeah, yeah. Let's let's briefly speak about that. So the, the gen token and kind of how that works in this circular economy. So... I think, and I think that's really interesting and, and, and um, to be honest, it took us a lot of time to crystallize that model and I think it's quite hard to build a really robust model. Um, so the, the idea is that identifying, you know, what is valuable right now. So I, you know, in, in our ecosystem, in the DAO ecosystem, the claim is that, you know, the hardest thing is, is coordination at scale. That, that is the thing, that is the thing, right? I mean, of course, you need contracts and all that, but it's not enough. Um, and then I told you that there is a core problem to generate coordination scale. The, the core problem is that uh, there is a tension between scale and resilience, right? That's, 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 I, I'm arguing that it's a universal problem. It's not my problem. It's, it's any, any, you know, any project that will try to tackle that, that front will enter the same problem. And then I also told you that I think there is kind of universal solution to universal problem. This universal solution is not a protocol, it's a concept. As much as I would say there is a scale problem for, for, for blockchain, and there is a universal solution that we call today off-chain computation. That's a universal solution. Uh, well, it's not totally universal. There's also on-chain solution. There is non-chain solution. Um, but it's kind of like almost universal. And the same way I'm arguing that there is kind of like universal concept of holographic consensus, which allows you to make decisions in small numbers but then maintain resilience or um, make sure that those decisions are in line with majority by crypto-economically incentivizing, identifying the mismatch. So that's holographic consensus. Um, and I also told you that this holographic consensus requires to have certain prediction game, right? The prediction game of the entire ecosystem is done with the gen token. So while you can have many different applications on top of the stack, on top of ARC, and you can have many, many different DAOs using those many different applications, all of the prediction games that, that is critical to facilitate, to enable large-scale decision-making processes is being done with the gen token. Kind of like somewhat analogous, but in a very different way uh, to the Ethereum being the gas for consensus over the chain. Here, gen is the gas for large-scale decision-making, or it's, it's basically the token, the staking token for the prediction game over the DAO stack ecosystem.
So if you're going to have these different DAOs on, you know, let's say maybe Ethereum, or, or let's say you have different Plasma chains or different, maybe on Cosmos, different Ether main chains that run some of these different DAOs, right? Because of scalability, uh, you know, they probably won't all run on, on the Ethereum main chain. How could you then still use the gen token across all of these different, would you have, how would that work? That's not critical. You can, firstly, you can you can still have the prediction game on the main chain, but I don't I don't think you need to because you can have many many different sub tokens on the sub chains. There, are, I mean, when, when you work when you work on a sub chain, doesn't mean that you cannot use ether, right? You can still you can you can use tokens on the sub chain that reflect the ether or reflect some other tokens. So it's not that the off chain layers will not be interoperable in terms of token economics. So I don't think I don't see any. Or, or could you have like one chain? where it's like a prediction market chain and all of the predictions and, and economics for all of the different DAOs that may live on different chains take place there. Yeah, sure. To be, you know, uh, fully transparent, we, this current version is already on the mainnet. I mean, this current version of the stack is, is fully on-chain, so it's not scalable in terms of blockchain scalability. Um, while I think you, you, you can already uh, use it for some level of organization, Maybe not millions of people, but maybe thousands of people, um, and maybe not you know daily decisions, but maybe weekly decisions. And then already the like next to next version, we are planning to completely optionize uh, that platform. So, so let's talk perhaps a bit about roadmap uh, and uh, where where the project currently stands. So uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, you done a crowd sale and that you'd raised uh, at the time around thirty million dollars. So where are you currently at in terms of project development and, uh, and when should we expect to see uh, the, DAO, the DAO stack platform launch? Right. So we are launching the stack and Alchemy is the first application, um, I mean, literally these days. Uh, it's, it's ready for launch. We actually, we're, we're just postponing a bit just to reorganize after the sale. We have a lot of things to wrap up. Uh, and then right right away after that, we are launching the pilot, the first pilot. Um, so you know, June it will be already running the pilot uh, of the Genesis DAO. So the first you know use case will will actually hold the real fund in Ether and let a, a large crowd to co manage that fund around the DAO stack project. So that's like a, the pilot of pilot. Then we want to have like a you know a few iterations on that pilot and also including pilots with some other teams. Uh, such as I will tell you about a few use cases, uh, in particular Gnosis, which are close partners of ours. Um, actually, Gnosis, uh, we, are, we are running two, two experiments. One experiment is that Gnosis themselves, they are launching their decentralized exchange, uh, DutchX, and want to have that DutchX completely managed by a DAO, so that DAO will run on the DAO stack platform. And the second experiment is that DAO, you know, Gnosis themselves, they want to reward, incentivize developers to build on top of the Gnosis platform, application on top of the Gnosis platform with the, using their prediction market, and then reward them with, with Gnosis tokens. So that, that reward process will also uh, use Alchemy, um, or at least partially use Alchemy, uh, and experiment with that. So these are the two experiments with, with Gnosis and one experiment in-house uh, with the Genesis fund, firstly in alpha, and later in, in the, you know, kind of like public beta. And then we have a few other applications already uh, in process, of integration. So the idea is that the first, uh, if you want Q3, will be dedicated to piloting. Uh, firstly, our own Genesis DAO, but then also a few other, maybe two, three other projects. Um, and mostly piloting, uh, stabilizing the, the, the system uh, in terms of you know, operation, gas cost, uh, uh, scale, uh, protocol parameters, uh, vector attacks, sorry, attack vectors, uh, and so on and so forth. So stabilizing system, and then in Q4 actually launching uh, uh, you know real real full products uh, again, including the Genesis fund, but with you know like much more significant amount of funds uh, as well as Gnosis experiments, and, and then a few, at least one at least one other uh, application that is already in process. So that's that's in terms of like I would say six months uh, timeline. Uh, in twenty, I would say that. Uh, Anyway, we would like to have a few live experiments by the end of this year. Um, in 2019, 
our focus will be on one hand to a, a, a widespread the usage of this of the system and by that we're not going to you know develop many many applications ourselves we are putting a lot of efforts and focus on building the technology in a way which is very easily uh, usable integrable by others so whether you need a whole DAO for yourself or, or maybe you, you have your system but you just need you know component uh, the centralized component then you can easily integ integrate with the stack so yeah, the idea, is, the idea is kind of to build, build horizontal uh, platform and ecosystem uh, for many different uh, uh, integrations. So while once one, one uh, front to proceed with in 2019, next year, will be to widespread that adoption, the second will be to uh, iterate heavily on the technology. Um, right now, the gas costs are still high. Uh, it's all, everything is on chain. I mean, we want to optimize that. Everything is on chain. We want to optionize everything, or not, you know, most things. Um, integrations with, you know, with 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 uh, with other 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 tools such as identity, uh, uport kind of thing. Um, integration with the decentralized databases such as IPFS. Integration with external services such as Slack and Trello, and so on and so forth. So so. I mean, I, maybe you can you can actually separate into three into three categories. One would be like market adoption, like massive adoption. I, we we actually believe that this would be the killer. I mean, DAOs basically are potentially be, would be the killer apps on Ethereum. So one would be massive uh, uh, community adoption. Another would be a heavy iteration on the technology, and third would be um, I would say UX. So kind of like integration with existing tools and so on and so forth. Cool. Oh, well, uh, thanks so much, Martin. That was super interesting. I'm, I'm really excited about uh, DAO stack, where it is and where it's going to go. I, I, I totally agree with you, Dev. I think finding new ways of collaborating, of organizing, of building uh, structures and, and organizational systems is one of the most exciting applications of blockchain. And I can't wait to see how this is going to turn out in real life. Thanks, Brian. I mean, I'm, I'm also like really looking forward to see this, you know, taking shape in reality. Thanks, guys, for having me here. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, we, we're gonna have links to to a bunch of resources about DAO stack. So if people wanna wanna check that out, then they can check out the show notes. And, and otherwise, thanks so much for a listener for once again tuning in. So we're putting out new episodes of Epicenter every week. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, on SoundCloud, your favorite podcast applications, or you can also watch the videos on youtube.com slash Epicenter Bitcoin. And if you want to support the show, you can leave us an iTunes review and that helps new people find, find the show and it helps us uh, keep this going. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.